Chapter Four of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Four Little Things. It's so wainy, I can't go out, and everybody is so cross they won't play with me said maud when polly found her fretting on the stairs and paused to ask the cause of her wails i'll play with you only don't scream and wake your mother what shall we play i don't know i'm tired of everything cause my toys are all broken and my dolls are all sick but clower moaned maud giving a jerk to the paris doll which she held upside down by one leg in the most unmaternal manner i'm going to dress a dolly for my little sister wouldn't you like to see me do it asked polly persuasively hoping to beguile the cross child and finish her own work at the same time no i shouldn't cause she'll look nicer than my clower her clothes won't come off and tom spoilt em playing ball with her in the yard wouldn't you like to rip these clothes off and have me show you how to make some new ones so you can dress and undress clara as much as you like yes i'd love to cut and maud's face brightened for destructiveness is one of the earliest traits of childhood and ripping was maud's delight establishing themselves in the deserted dining-room the children fell to work and when fanny discovered them maud was laughing with all her heart at poor clara who denuded of her finery was cutting up all sorts of capers in the hands of her merry little mistress i should think you'd be ashamed to play with dolls polly i haven't touched one this ever so long said fanny looking down with a superior air i ain't ashamed for it keeps maud happy and will please my sister kitty and i think sewing is better than prinking or reading silly novels so now and polly stitched away with a resolute air for she and fanny had had a little tiff because polly wouldn't let her friend do up her hair like other folks and bore her ears don't be cross dear but come and do something nice it's so dull to-day said fanny anxious to be friends again for it was doubly dull without polly can't i'm busy you always are busy i never saw such a girl what in the world do you find to do all the time said fanny watching with interest the set of the little red merino frock polly was putting on to her doll lots of things but i like to be lazy sometimes as much as you do to lie on the sofa and read fairy stories or think about nothing would you have a white muslin apron or a black silk added polly surveying her work with satisfaction muslin with pockets and tiny blue bows i'll show you how and forgetting her hate and contempt for dolls down sat fanny soon getting as much absorbed as either of the others the dull day brightened wonderfully after that and the time flew pleasantly as tongues and needles went together grandma peeped in and smiled at the busy group saying sew away my dears dollies are safe companions and needlework an accomplishment that's sadly neglected nowadays small stitches maud neat buttonholes fan cut carefully polly and don't waste your cloth take pains and the best needlewoman shall have a pretty bit of white satin for a doll's bonnet fanny exerted herself and won the prize for polly helped maud and neglected her own work but she didn't care much for mr shaw said looking at the three bright faces at the tea-table i guess polly has been making sunshine for you to-day no indeed sir i haven't done anything only dress maud's doll and polly didn't think she had done much but it was one of the little things which are always waiting to be done in this world of ours where rainy days come so often where spirits get out of tune and duty won't go hand in hand with pleasure little things of this sort are especially good work for little people a kind little thought an unselfish little act a cheery little word are so sweet and comfortable that no one can fail to feel their beauty and love the giver no matter how small they are 
mothers do a deal of this sort of thing unseen unthanked but felt and remembered long afterward and never lost for this is the simple magic that binds hearts together and keeps home happy polly had learned this secret she loved to do the little things that others did not see or were too busy to stop for and while doing them without a thought of thanks she made sunshine for herself as well as others there was so much love in her own home that she quickly felt the want of it in fanny's and puzzled herself to find out why these people were not kind and patient to one another she did not try to settle the question but did her best to love and serve and bear with each and the good will the gentle heart the helpful ways and simple manners of our polly made her dear to every one for these virtues even in a little child are lovely and attractive mr shaw was very kind to her for he liked her modest respectful manners and polly was so grateful for his many favors that she soon forgot her fear and showed her affection in all sorts of confiding little ways which pleased him extremely she used to walk across the park with him when he went to his office in the morning talking busily all the way and saying good-bye with a nod and a smile when they parted at the great gate at first mr shaw did not care much about it but soon he missed her if she did not come and found that something fresh and pleasant seemed to brighten all his day if a small gray-coated figure with an intelligent face a merry voice and a little hand slipped confidingly into his went with him through the wintry park coming home late he liked to see a curly brown head watching at the window to find his slippers ready his paper in its place and a pair of willing feet eager to wait upon him i wish my fanny was more like her he often said to himself as he watched the girls while they thought him deep in politics or the state of the money market poor mr shaw had been so busy getting rich that he had not found time to teach his children to love him he was more at leisure now and as his boy and girls grew up he missed something polly was unconsciously showing him what it was and making child love so sweet that he felt he could not do without it any more yet didn't quite know how to win the confidence of the children who had always found him busy indifferent and absent-minded as the girls were going to bed one night polly kissed grandma as usual and fanny laughed at her saying what a baby you are we are too old for such things now i don't think people are ever too old to kiss their fathers and mothers was the quick answer right my little polly and mr shaw stretched out his hand to her with such a kindly look that fanny stared surprised and then said shyly i thought you didn't care about it father i do my dear and mr shaw put out the other hand to fanny who gave him a daughterly kiss quite forgetting everything but the tender feeling that sprung up in her heart at the renewal of the childish custom which we never need outgrow mrs shaw was a nervous fussy invalid who wanted something every five minutes so polly found plenty of small things to do for her and did them so cheerfully that the poor lady loved to have the quiet helpful child near to wait upon her read to her run errands or hand the seven different shawls which were continually being put on or off grandma too was glad to find willing hands and feet to serve her and polly passed many happy hours in the quaint rooms learning all sorts of pretty arts and listening to pleasant chat never dreaming how much sunshine she brought to the solitary old lady tom was polly's rock ahead for a long time because he was always breaking out in a new place and one never knew where to find him he tormented yet amused her was kind one day and a bear the next at times she fancied he was never going to be bad again and the next thing she knew he was deep in mischief and hooted at the idea of repentance and reformation 
Polly gave him up as a hard case, but was so in the habit of helping any one who seemed in trouble that she was good to him simply because she couldn't help it. "'What's the matter? Is your lesson too hard for you?' she asked one evening, as a groan made her look across the table to where Tom sat scowling over a pile of dilapidated books, with his hands in his hair, as if his head was in danger of flying asunder with the tremendous effort he was making. Hard? Guess it is. What in thunder do I care about the old Carthaginians? Regulus wasn't bad, but I'm sick of him. And Tom dealt Harkness's Latin reader a thump, which expressed his feelings better than words. I like Latin, and used to get on well when I studied it with Jimmy. Perhaps I can help you a little bit, said Polly, as Tom wiped his hot face and refreshed himself with a peanut. You? Pah. Girls' Latin don't amount to much anyway, was the grateful reply. But Polly was used to him now, and, nothing daunted, took a look at the grimy page in the middle of which Tom had stuck. She read it so well that the young gentleman stopped munching to regard her with respectful astonishment, and when she stopped, he said suspiciously, "'You are a sly one, Polly, to study up so you can show off before me. But it won't do, ma'am. Turn over a dozen pages and try again.' Polly obeyed, and did even better than before, saying, as she looked up, with a laugh, "'I've been through the whole book, so you won't catch me that way, Tom.' "'I say, how came you to know such a lot?' asked Tom, much impressed. "'I studied with Jimmy, and kept up with him, for Father let us be together in all our lessons. It was so nice, and we learned so fast.' "'Tell me about Jimmy. He's your brother, isn't he?' "'Yes, but he's dead, you know. I'll tell about him some other time. You ought to study now, and perhaps I can help you,' said Polly, with a little quiver of the lips. "'Shouldn't wonder if you could.' And Tom spread the book between them with a grave and business-like air, for he felt that Polly had got the better of him, and it behooved him to do his best for the honor of his sex. He went at the lesson with a will, and soon floundered out of his difficulties, for Polly gave him a lift here and there, and they went on swimmingly, till they came to some rules to be learned. Polly had forgotten them, so they both committed them to memory. Tom, with hands in his pockets, rocked to and fro, muttering rapidly, while Polly twisted the little curl on her forehead and stared at the wall, gabbling with all her might. Done! cried Tom, presently. Done! echoed Polly, and then they heard each other recite till both were perfect. That's pretty good fun! said tom joyfully tossing poor harkness away and feeling that the pleasant excitement of companionship could lend a charm even to latin grammar now ma'am we'll take a turn at algebra i like that as much as i hate latin polly accepted the invitation and soon owned that tom could beat her here this fact restored his equanimity but he didn't crow over her far from it for he helped her with a paternal patience that made her eyes twinkle with suppressed fun as he soberly explained and illustrated unconsciously imitating dominie dean till polly found it difficult to keep from laughing in his face you may have another go at it any time you like generously remarked tom as he shied the algebra after the latin reader i'll come every evening then i'd like to for i haven't studied a bit since i came you shall try and make me like algebra, and I'll try and make you like Latin, will you? Oh, I'd like it well enough, if there was any one explain it to me. Old Dean puts us through double quick. Don't give a fellow time to ask questions when we read. Ask your father. He knows. Don't believe he does. Shouldn't dare to bother him if he did. Why not? He'd pull my ears and call me a stupid, or tell me not to worry him. I don't think he would. He's very kind to me, and I ask lots of questions. He likes you better than he does me. Now, Tom, it's wrong of you to say so. Of course he loves you ever so much more than he does me, cried Polly, reprovingly. Why don't he show it, then? muttered Tom, with a half-wistful, half-defiant glance toward the library door, which stood ajar. 
"'You act so. How can he?' asked Polly, after a pause, in which she put Tom's question to herself, and could find no better reply than the one she gave him. "'Why don't he give me my velocipede? He said if I did well at school for a month I should have it. And I've been pegging away like fury for most six weeks, and he don't do a thing about it. The girls get their duds because they tease. I won't do that anyway. But you don't catch me studying myself to death and no pay for it. It is too bad. But you ought to do it because it's right, and never mind being paid. Began Polly, trying to be moral, but secretly sympathizing heartily with poor Tom. Don't you preach, Polly. If the governor took any notice of me, and cared how I got on, I wouldn't mind the president so much. But he don't care a hang, and never even asked if I did well last declamation day, when I'd gone and learned the Battle of Lake Regulus, because he said he liked it. Oh, Tom, did you say that? It's splendid. Jim and I used to say Horatius together, and it was such fun. Do speak your piece to me. I do so like Macaulay's lays. It's dreadful long, began Tom, but his face brightened, for Polly's interest soothed his injured feelings, and he was glad to prove his elocutionary powers. He began without much spirit, but soon the martial ring of the lines fired him, and before he knew it, he was on his legs thundering away in grand style, while Polly listened with kindling face and absorbed attention. Tom did declaim well, for he quite forgot himself, and delivered the stirring ballad with an energy that made Polly flush and tingle with admiration and delight, and quite electrified a second listener, who had heard all that went on, and watched the little scene from behind his newspaper. As Tom paused, breathless, and Polly clapped her hands enthusiastically, the sound was loudly echoed from behind him— both whirled round, and there was Mr. Shaw, standing in the doorway, applauding with all his might. Tom looked much abashed, and said not a word. Polly ran to Mr. Shaw, and danced before him, saying, eagerly, "'Wasn't it splendid? Didn't he do well? Mayn't he have his velocipede now?' "'Capital, Tom! You'll be an orator yet. Learn another piece like that.' and I'll come and hear you speak it. Are you ready for your velocipede, hey? Polly was right, and Tom owned that the governor was kind, did like him, and hadn't entirely forgotten his promise. The boy turned red with pleasure, and picked at the buttons on his jacket, while listening to this unexpected praise, but when he spoke he looked straight up in his father's face, while his own shone with pleasure, as he answered in one breath, "'Thank you, sir. I'll do it, sir. Guess I am, sir.' "'Very good. Then look out for your new horse to-morrow, sir.' And Mr. Shaw stroked the fuzzy red head with a kind hand, feeling a fatherly pleasure in the conviction that there was something in his boy after all. Tom got his velocipede the next day, named it Black Oster, in memory of the horse in The Battle of Lake Regillus, and came to grief as soon as he began to ride his new steed. "'Come out and see me go it,' whispered Tom to Polly, after three days' practice in the street, for he had already learned to ride in the rink. Polly and Maud willingly went, and watched his struggles with deep interest till he got an upset which nearly put an end to his velocipeding forever. "'Hi there! Oster's coming!' shouted Tom, as he came rattling down the long, steep street outside the park. They stepped aside, and he whizzed by, arms and legs going like mad, with the general appearance of a runaway engine. It would have been a triumphant descent if a big dog had not bounced suddenly through one of the openings and sent the whole concern helter-skelter into the gutter. Polly laughed as she ran to view the ruin, for Tom lay flat on his back with the velocipede atop him, while the big dog barked wildly, and his master scolded him for his awkwardness. 
but when she saw tom's face polly was frightened for the color had all gone out of it his eyes looked strange and dizzy and drops of blood began to trickle from a great cut on his forehead the man saw it too and had him up in a minute but he couldn't stand and stared about him in a dazed sort of way as he sat on the curbstone while polly held her handkerchief to his forehead and pathetically begged to know if he was killed don't scare mother i'm all right got upset didn't i he asked presently eyeing the prostrate velocipede with more anxiety about its damages than his own i knew you'd hurt yourself with that horrid thing just let it be and come home for your head bleeds dreadfully and everybody is looking at us whispered polly trying to tie the little handkerchief over the ugly cut come on then jove how queer my head feels give us a booze please stop howling maud and come home you bring the machine and i'll, I'll pay you pat as he spoke tom slowly picked himself up and steadying himself by polly's shoulder issued commands and the procession fell into line first the big dog barking at intervals then the good-natured irishman trundling that's devil of a whirly gig as he disrespectfully called the idolized velocipede then the wounded hero supported by the helpful polly and maud brought up the rear in tears bearing tom's cap unfortunately mrs shaw was out driving with grandma and fanny was making calls so that there was no one but polly to stand by tom for the parlor-maid turned faint at the sight of blood and the chambermaid lost her wits in the flurry it was a bad cut and must be sewed up at once the doctor said as soon as he came somebody must hold his head he added as he threaded his queer little needle i'll keep still but if anybody must hold me let polly you ain't afraid are you asked tom with imploring look for he didn't like the idea of being sewed a bit polly was just going to shrink away saying oh i can't when she remembered that tom once called her a coward here was a chance to prove that she wasn't besides poor tom had no one else to help him so she came up to the sofa where he lay and nodded reassuringly as she put a soft little hand on either side of the damaged head you are a trump polly whispered tom then he set his teeth clenched his hands lay quite still and bore it like a man it was all over in a minute or two and when he had had a glass of wine and was nicely settled on his bed he felt pretty comfortable in spite of the pain in his head and being ordered to keep quiet he said thank you ever so much polly and watched her with a grateful face as she crept away he had to keep the house for a week and laid about looking very interesting with a great black patch on his forehead every one petted him for the doctor said that if the blow had been an inch nearer the temple it would have been fatal and the thought of losing him so suddenly made bluff old tom very precious all at once his father asked him how he was a dozen times a day his mother talked continually of that dear boy's narrow escape and grandma cockered him up with every delicacy she could invent and the girls waited on him like devoted slaves this new treatment had an excellent effect for when neglected tom got over his first amazement at this change of base he blossomed out delightfully as sick people do sometimes and surprised his family by being unexpectedly patient grateful and amiable nobody ever knew how much good it did him for boys seldom have confidences of this sort except with their mothers and mrs shaw had never found the key to her son's heart but a little seed was sowed then that took root and though it grew very slowly it came to something in the end perhaps polly helped it a little evening was his hardest time for want of exercise made him as restless and nervous as it was possible for a hardy lad to be on such short notice he couldn't sleep so the girls amused him fanny played and read aloud 
polly sung and told stories and did the latter so well that it got to be a regular thing for her to begin as soon as twilight came and tom was settled in his favorite place on grandma's sofa fire away polly said the young sultan one evening as his little scheherazade sat down in her low chair after stirring up the fire till the room was bright and cosy i don't feel like stories to-night tom i've told all i know and can't make up any more answered polly leaning her head on her hand with a sorrowful look that tom had never seen before he watched her a minute and then asked curiously what were you thinking about just now when you sat staring at the fire and getting soberer and soberer every minute i was thinking about jimmy would you mind telling me about him you know you said you would some time but don't if you'd rather not said tom lowering his rough voice respectfully i like to talk about him but there isn't much to tell began polly grateful for his interest sitting here with you reminded me of the way i used to sit with him when he was sick we used to have such happy times and it's so pleasant to think about them now he was awfully good wasn't he no he wasn't but he tried to be and mother says that is half the battle we used to get tired of trying but we kept making resolutions and working hard to keep em i don't think i got on much but jimmy did and every one loved him didn't you ever squabble as we do yes indeed sometimes but we couldn't stay mad and always made it up again as soon as we could jimmy used to come round first and say all serene polly so kind and jolly that i couldn't help laughing and being friends right away did he not know a lot yes i think he did for he liked to study and wanted to get on so he could help father people used to call him a fine boy and i felt so proud to hear it but they didn't know half how wise he was because he didn't show off a bit i suppose sisters always are grand of their brothers but i don't believe many girls had as much right to be as i had most girls don't care two pins about their brothers so that shows you don't know much about it well they ought to if they don't and they would if the boys were as kind to them as jimmy was to me why what did he do loved me dearly and wasn't ashamed to show it cried polly with a sob in her voice that made her answer very eloquent what made him die polly asked tom soberly after a little pause he got hurt coasting last winter but he never told which boy did it and he only lived a week i helped take care of him and he was so patient i used to wonder at him for he was in dreadful pain all the time he gave me his books and his dog and his speckled hens and his big knife and said good-bye polly and kissed me the last thing and then oh jimmy jimmy if he only could come back poor polly's eyes had been getting fuller and fuller lips trembling more and more as she went on when she came to that good-bye she couldn't get any further but covered up her face and cried as if her heart would break tom was full of sympathy but didn't know how to show it so he sat shaking up the camphor bottle and trying to think of something proper and comfortable to say when fanny came to the rescue and cuddled polly in her arms with soothing little pats and whispers and kisses till the tears stopped and polly said she didn't mean to and wouldn't any more i've been thinking about my dear boy all the evening for tom reminds me of him she added with a sigh me how can i when i ain't a bit like him cried tom amazed but you are in some ways wish i was but i can't be for he was good you know so are you when you choose hasn't he been good and patient and don't we all like to pet him when he's clever fan said polly whose heart was still aching for her brother and ready for his sake to find virtues even in tormenting tom yes i don't know the boy lately but he'll be as bad as ever when he's well returned fanny who hadn't much faith in sick-bed repentances 
much you know about it growled tom lying down again for he had sat bolt upright when polly made the astounding declaration that he was like the well-beloved jimmy that simple little history had made a deep impression on tom and the tearful ending touched the tender spot that most boys hide so carefully it is very pleasant to be loved and admired very sweet to think we shall be missed and mourned when we die and tom was seized with a sudden desire to imitate this boy who hadn't done anything wonderful yet was so dear to his sister that she cried for him a whole year after he was dead so studious and clever the people called him a fine fellow and so anxious to be good that he kept on trying till he was better even than polly whom tom privately considered a model of virtue as girls go i just wish i had a sister like you he broke out all of a sudden and i just wish i had a brother like jim cried fanny for she felt the reproach in tom's words and knew she deserved it i shouldn't think you'd envy anybody for you've got one another said polly with such a wistful look that it suddenly set tom and fanny to wondering why they didn't have better times together and enjoy themselves as polly and jim did fan don't care for anybody but herself said tom tom is such a bear retorted fanny i wouldn't say such things for if anything should happen to either of you the other one would feel so sorry every cross word i ever said to jimmy comes back now and makes me wish i hadn't two great tears rolled down polly's cheeks and were quietly wiped away but i think they watered that sweet sentiment called fraternal love which till now had been neglected in the hearts of this brother and sister they didn't say anything then or make any plans or confess any faults but when they parted for the night fanny gave the wounded head a gentle pat tom never would have forgiven her if she had kissed him and said in a whisper i hope you'll have a good sleep tommy dear and tom nodded back at her with a hearty same to you fan that was all but it meant a good deal for the voices were kind and the eyes met full of that affection which makes words of little consequence polly saw it and though she didn't know that she had made the sunshine it shone back upon her so pleasantly that she fell happily asleep though her jimmy wasn't there to say good night end of chapter four Chapter Five of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Five Scrapes. After being unusually good, children are apt to turn short round and refresh themselves by acting like Sancho. For a week after Tom's mishap, the young folks were quite angelic, so much so that Grandma said she was afraid something was going to happen to them. The dear old lady needn't have felt anxious, for such excessive virtue doesn't last long enough to lead to translation, except with little prigs in the goody story books, and no sooner was Tom on his legs again when the whole party went astray, and much tribulation was the consequence. It all began with Polly's stupidity, as Fan said afterward just as polly ran down to meet mr shaw one evening and was helping him off with his coat the bell rang and a fine bouquet of hot-house flowers was left in polly's hands for she never could learn city ways and open the door herself hey what's this my little polly is beginning early after all said mr shaw laughing as he watched the girl's face dimple and flush as she smelt the lovely nosegay and glanced at a note half hidden in the heliotrope now if polly hadn't been stupid as fan said she would have had her wits about her and let it pass 
but you see polly was an honest little soul and it never occurred to her that there was any need of concealment so she answered in her straightforward way oh they ain't for me sir they're for fan for mr frank i guess she'll be so pleased that puppy sends her things of this sort does he and mr shaw looked far from pleased as he pulled out the note and coolly opened it polly had her doubts about fan's approval of that sort of thing but dared not say a word and stood thinking how she used to show her father the funny valentines the boys sent her and how they laughed over them together but mr shaw did not laugh when he had read the sentimental verses accompanying the bouquet and his face quite scared polly as he asked angrily how long has this nonsense been going on indeed sir i don't know fan doesn't mean any harm i wish i hadn't said anything stammered polly remembering the promise given to fanny the day of the concert she had forgotten all about it and had become accustomed to see the big boys as she called mr frank and his friends with the girls on all occasions now it suddenly occurred to her that mr shaw didn't like such amusements and had forbidden fan to indulge in them oh dear how mad she will be well i can't help it girls shouldn't have secrets from their fathers then there wouldn't be any fuss thought polly as she watched mr shaw twist up the pink note and poke it back among the flowers which he took from her saying shortly send fanny to me in the library now you've done it you stupid thing cried fanny both angry and dismayed when polly delivered the message why what else could i do asked polly much disturbed let him think the bouquet was for you then there'd have been no trouble but that would have been doing a lie which is most as bad as telling one don't be a goose you've got me into a scrape and you ought to help me out i will if i can but i won't tell lies for anybody cried polly getting excited nobody wants you to just hold your tongue and let me manage then i'd better not go down began polly when a stern voice from below called like bluebeard are you coming down yes sir answered a meek voice and fanny clutched polly whispering you must come i'm frightened out of my wits when he speaks like that stand by me polly there's a dear i will whispered sister anne and down they went with fluttering hearts mr shaw stood on the rug looking rather grim the bouquet lay on the table and beside it a note directed to frank moore esq in a very decided hand with a fierce-looking flourish after the esq pointing to this impressive epistle mr shaw said knitting his black eyebrows as he looked at fanny i'm going to put a stop to this nonsense at once and if i see any more of it i'll send you to school in a canadian convent this awful threat quite took polly's breath away but fanny had heard it before and having a temper of her own said i'm sure i haven't done anything so very dreadful i can't help it if the boys send me philopena presents as they do to the other girls there was nothing about philopenas in the note but that's not the question i forbid you to have anything to do with this moor he's not a boy but a fast fellow and i won't have him about you knew this and yet you disobeyed me i hardly ever see him began fanny is that true asked mr shaw turning suddenly to polly oh please sir don't ask me i promised i wouldn't that is fanny will tell you cried polly quite red with distress at the predicament she was in no matter about your promise tell me all you know of this absurd affair it will do fanny more good than harm and mr shaw sat down looking more amiable for polly's dismay touched him may i she whispered to fanny i don't care answered fan looking both angry and ashamed as she stood sullenly tying knots in her handkerchief so polly told with much reluctance and much questioning all she knew of the walks the lunches the meetings and the notes 
it wasn't much and evidently less serious than mr shaw expected for as he listened his eyebrows smoothed themselves out and more than once his lips twitched as if he wanted to laugh for after all it was rather comical to see how the young people aped their elders playing the new-fashioned game quite unconscious of its real beauty power and sacredness oh please sir don't blame fan much for she truly isn't half as silly as trix and the other girls she wouldn't go sleigh-riding though mr frank teased and she wanted to ever so much she's sorry i know and won't forget what you say any more if you'll forgive her this once cried polly very earnestly when the foolish little story was told i don't see how i can help it when you plead so well for her come here fan and mind this one thing drop all this nonsense and attend to your books or off you go and canada is no joke in winter time let me tell you as he spoke mr shaw stroked his sulky daughter's cheek hoping to see some sign of regret but fanny felt injured and wouldn't show that she was sorry so she only said pettishly i suppose i can have my flowers now the fuss is over they are going straight back where they came from with a line from me which will keep that puppy from ever sending you any more ringing the bell mr shaw dispatched the unfortunate posy and then turned to polly saying kindly but gravely set this silly child of mine a good example and do your best for her won't you me what can i do sir asked polly looking ready but quite ignorant how to begin make her as like yourself as possible my dear nothing would please me better now go and let us hear no more of this folly they went without a word and mr shaw heard no more of the affair but poor polly did for fan scolded her till polly thought seriously of packing up and going home next day i really haven't the heart to relate the dreadful lectures she got the snubs she suffered or the cold shoulders turned upon her for several days after this polly's heart was full but she told no one and bore her trouble silently feeling her friend's ingratitude and injustice deeply tom found out what the matter was and sided with polly which proceeding led to scrape number two where's fan asked the young gentleman strolling into his sister's room where polly lay on the sofa trying to forget her troubles in an interesting book downstairs seeing company why didn't you go too i don't like tricks and i don't know her fine new york friends don't want to neither why don't you say not polite who cares i say polly come and have some fun i'd rather read that isn't polite polly laughed and turned a page tom whistled a minute then sighed deeply and put his hand to his forehead which the black plaster still adorned does your head ache asked polly awfully better lie down then can't i'm fidgety and want to be amused as pug says just wait till i finish my chapter and then i'll come said pitiful polly all right returned the perjured boy who had discovered that a broken head was sometimes more useful than a whole one and exulting in his base stratagem he roved about the room till fan's bureau arrested him it was covered with all sorts of finery for she had dressed in a hurry and left everything topsy-turvy a well-conducted boy would have let things alone or a moral brother would have put things to right being neither tom rummaged to his heart's content till fan's drawers looked as if some one had been making hay in them he tried the effect of earrings ribbons and collars wound up the watch though it wasn't time burnt his inquisitive nose with smelling salts deluged his grimy handkerchief with fan's best cologne anointed his curly crop with her hair oil powdered his face with her violet powder and finished off by pinning on a bunch of false ringlets which fanny tried to keep a profound secret the ravages committed by this bad boy are beyond the power of language to describe as he revelled in the interesting drawers boxes and cases which held his sister's treasures 
when the curls had been put on with much pricking of fingers and a blue ribbon added la fan he surveyed himself with satisfaction and considered the effect so fine that he was inspired to try a still greater metamorphosis the dress fan had taken off lay on a chair and into it got tom chuckling with suppressed laughter for polly was absorbed and the bed curtains hid his iniquity fan's best velvet jacket and hat ermine muff and a sofa pillow for pannier finished off the costume and tripping along with elbows out tom appeared before the amazed polly just as the chapter ended she enjoyed the joke so heartily that tom forgot consequences and proposed going down into the parlor to surprise the girls goodness no fanny would never forgive us if you showed her curls and things to those people there are gentlemen among them and it wouldn't be proper said polly alarmed at the idea all the more fun fan hasn't treated you well and it will serve her right if you introduce me as your dear friend miss shaw come on it'll be a jolly lark i wouldn't for the world it would be so mean take em off tom and i'll play anything else you like i ain't going to dress up for nothing i look so lovely someone must admire me take me down polly and see if they don't call me a sweet creature tom looked so unutterably ridiculous as he tossed his curls and pranced that polly went off into another gale of merriment but even while she laughed she resolved not to let him mortify his sister now then get out of the way if you won't come i'm going down said tom no you're not how will you help it miss prim so and polly locked the door put the key in her pocket and nodded at him defiantly tom was a pepper-pot as to temper and anything like opposition always had a bad effect forgetting his costume he strode up to polly saying with a threatening wag of the head none of that i won't stand it promise not to plague fan and i'll let you out won't promise anything give me that key or i'll make you now tom don't be savage i only want to keep you out of a scrape for fan will be raging if you go take off her things and i'll give up tom vouchsafed no reply but marched to the other door which was fast as polly knew looked out of the three-story window and finding no escape possible came back with a wrathful face will you give me that key no i won't said polly valiantly i'm stronger than you are so you better hand over i know you are but it's cowardly for a great boy like you to rob a girl i don't want to hurt you but by george i won't stand this tom paused as polly spoke evidently ashamed of himself but his temper was up and he wouldn't give in if polly had cried a little just here he would have yielded unfortunately she giggled for tom's fierce attitude was such a funny contrast to his dress that she couldn't help it that settled the matter no girl that ever lived should giggle at him much less lock him up like a small child without a word he made a grab at polly's arm for the hand holding the key was still in her pocket with her other hand she clutched her frock and for a minute held on stoutly but tom's strong fingers were irresistible rip went the pocket out came the hand and with a cry of pain from polly the key fell on the floor it's your own fault if you're hurt i didn't mean to muttered tom as he hastily departed leaving polly to groan over her sprained wrist he went down but not into the parlor for somehow the joke seemed to have lost its relish so he made the girls in the kitchen laugh and then crept up the back way hoping to make it all right with polly but she had gone to grandma's room for though the old lady was out it seemed a refuge he had just time to get things in order when fanny came up crosser than ever for trix had been telling her of all sorts of fun in which she might have had a share if polly had held her tongue where is she asked fan wishing to vent her vexation on her friend moping in her room i suppose replied tom who was discovered reading studiously 
now while this had been happening maud had been getting into hot water also for when her maid left her to see a friend below miss maud paraded into polly's room and solaced herself with mischief in an evil hour polly had let her play boat in her big trunk which stood empty since then polly had stored some of her most private treasures in the upper tray so that she might feel sure they were safe from all eyes she had forgotten to lock the trunk and when maud raised the lid to begin her voyage several objects of interest met her eyes she was deep in her researches when fan came in and looked over her shoulder feeling too cross with polly to chide maud as polly had no money for presents she had exerted her ingenuity to devise all sorts of gifts hoping by quantity to atone for any shortcomings in quality some of her attempts were successful others were failures but she kept them all fine or funny knowing the children at home would enjoy anything new some of maud's cast-off toys had been neatly mended for kitty some of fan's old ribbons and laces were converted into doll's finery and tom's little figures whittled out of wood in idle minutes were laid away to show will what could be done with a knife what rubbish said fanny queer girl isn't she added tom who had followed to see what was going on don't you laugh at polly's things she makes nicer dolls than you fan and she can wait and draw ever so much better than tom cried maud how do you know i never saw her draw said tom here's a book with lots of pictures in it i can't read the writing but the pictures are so funny eager to display her friend's accomplishments maud pulled out a fat little book marked polly's journal and spread it in her lap only the pictures no harm in taking a look at em said tom just one peep answered fanny and the next minute both were laughing at a droll sketch of tom in the gutter with the big dog howling over him and the velocipede running away very rough and faulty but so funny that it was evident polly's sense of humor was strong a few pages farther back came fanny and mr frank caricatured then grandma carefully done tom reciting his battle piece mr shaw and polly in the park maud being borne away by katie and all the school girls turned into ridicule with an unsparing hand sly little puss to make fun of us behind our backs said fan rather nettled by polly's quiet retaliation for many slights from herself and friends she does draw well said tom looking critically at the sketch of a boy with a pleasant face round whom polly had drawn rays like the sun and under which was written my dear jimmy you wouldn't admire her if you knew what she wrote here about you said fanny whose eyes had strayed to the written page opposite and lingered there long enough to read something that excited her curiosity what is it asked tom forgetting his honorable resolves for a minute she says i try to like tom and when he is pleasant we do very well but he don't stay so long he gets cross and rough and disrespectful to his father and mother and plagues us girls and is so horrid i almost hate him it's very wrong but i can't help it how do you like that asked fanny go ahead and see how she comes down on you ma'am retorted tom who had read on a bit does she and fanny continued rapidly as for fan i don't think we can be friends any more for she told her father a lie and won't forgive me for not doing so too i used to think her a very fine girl but i don't now if she would be as kind as she was when i first knew her i should love her just the same but she isn't kind to me and though she is always talking about politeness i don't think it is polite to treat company as she does me she thinks i am odd and countrified and i dare say i am but i shouldn't laugh at a girl's clothes because she was poor or keep her out of the way because she didn't do just as other girls do here i see her make fun of me and i can't feel as i did and i'd go home only it would seem ungrateful to mr shaw and grandma and i do love them dearly i say fan you've got it now shut the book and come away 
cried tom enjoying this broadside immensely but feeling guilty as well he might just one bit more whispered fanny turning on a page or two and stopping at a leaf that was blurred here and there as if tears had dropped on it sunday morning early nobody is up to spoil my quiet time and i must write my journal for i've been so bad lately i couldn't bear to do it i'm glad my visit is most done for things worry me here and there isn't any one to help me get right when i get wrong i used to envy fanny but i don't now for her father and mother don't take care of her as mine do of me she is afraid of her father and makes her mother do as she likes i'm glad i came though for i see money don't give people everything but i'd like a little all the same for it is so comfortable to buy nice things i read over my journal just now and i'm afraid it's not a good one for i've said all sorts of things about the people here and it isn't kind i should tear it out only i promised to keep my diary and i want to talk over things that puzzle me with mother i see now that it is my fault a good deal for i haven't been half as patient and pleasant as i ought to be i will truly try for the rest of the time and be as good and grateful as i can for i want them to like me though i'm only an old-fashioned country girl that last sentence made fanny shut the book with a face full of self-reproach for she had said those words herself in a fit of petulance and polly had made no answer though her eyes filled and her cheeks burned fan opened her lips to say something but not a sound followed for there stood polly looking at them with an expression they had never seen before what are you doing with my things she demanded in a low tone while her eyes kindled and her color changed maud showed us a book she found and we were just looking at the pictures began fanny dropping it as if it burnt her fingers and reading my journal and laughing at my presence and then putting the blame on maud it's the meanest thing i ever saw and i'll never forgive you as long as i live polly said this all in one indignant breath and then as if afraid of saying too much ran out of the room with such a look of mingled contempt grief and anger that the three culprits stood dumb with shame tom hadn't even a whistle at his command maud was so scared at gentle polly's outbreak that she sat as still as a mouse while fanny conscience-stricken laid back the poor little presence with a respectful hand for somehow the thought of polly's poverty came over her as it never had done before and these odds and ends so carefully treasured up for those at home touched fanny and grew beautiful in her eyes as she laid by the little book the confessions in it reproached her more sharply than any words polly could have spoken for she had laughed at her friend had slighted her sometimes and been unforgiving for an innocent offence that last page where polly took the blame on herself and promised to truly try to be more kind and patient went to fanny's heart melting all the coldness away and she could only lay her head on the trunk sobbing it wasn't polly's fault it was all mine tom still red with shame at being caught in such a scrape left fanny to her tears and went manfully away to find the injured polly and confess his manifold transgressions but polly couldn't be found he searched high and low in every room yet no sign of the girl appeared and tom began to get anxious she can't have run away home can she he said to himself as he paused before the hat tree there was the little round hat and tom gave it a remorseful smooth remembering how many times he had tweaked it half off or poked it over poor polly's eyes maybe she's gone down to the office to tell pa tisn't a bit like her though anyway i'll take a look round the corner eager to get his boots tom pulled open the door of a dark closet under the stairs and nearly tumbled over backward with surprise for there on the floor with her head pillowed on a pair of rubbers lay polly in an attitude of despair 
this mournful spectacle sent tom's penitent speech straight out of his head and with an astonished hello he stood and stared in impressive silence polly wasn't crying and lay so still that tom began to think she might be in a fit or a faint and bent anxiously down to inspect the pathetic bunch a glimpse of her wet eyelashes a round cheek redder than usual and lips parted by quick breathing relieved his mind upon that point so taking courage he sat down on the boot-jack and begged pardon like a man now polly was very angry and i think she had a right to be but she was not resentful and after the first flash was over she soon began to feel better about it it wasn't easy to forgive but as she listened to tom's honest voice getting gruff with remorse now and then she couldn't harden her heart against him or refuse to make up when he so frankly owned that it was confounded mean to read her book that way she liked his coming and begging pardon at once it was a handsome thing to do she appreciated it and forgave him in her heart some time before she did with her lips for to tell the truth polly had a spice of girlish malice and rather liked to see domineering tom eat humble pie just enough to do him good you know she felt that atonement was proper and considered it no more than just that fan should drench a handkerchief or two with repentant tears and that tom should sit on a very uncomfortable seat and call himself hard names for five or ten minutes before she relented come now do say a word to a fellow i'm getting the worst of it anyway for there's fan crying her eyes out upstairs and here are you stowed away in a dark closet as dumb as a fish and nobody but me to bring you both round i'd have cut over to the smize and got ma home to fix things only it looked like backing out of the scrape so i didn't said tom as a last appeal polly was glad to hear that fan was crying it would do her good but she couldn't help softening to tom who did seem in a predicament between two weeping damsels a little smile began to dimple the cheek that wasn't hidden and then a hand came slowly out from under the curly head and was stretched toward him silently tom was just going to give it a hearty shake when he saw a red mark on the wrist and knew what made it his face changed and he took the chubby hand so gently that polly peeped to see what it meant will you forgive that too he asked in a whisper stroking the red wrist yes it don't hurt much now and polly drew her hand away sorry he had seen it i was a beast that's what i was said tom in a tone of great disgust and just at that awkward minute down tumbled his father's old beaver over his head and face putting a comical quencher on his self-reproaches of course neither could help laughing at that and when he emerged polly was sitting up looking as much better for her shower as he did for his momentary eclipse fan feels dreadfully will you kiss and be friends if i trot her down asked tom remembering his fellow sinner i'll go to her and polly whisked out of the closet as suddenly as she had whisked in leaving tom sitting on the boot-jack with a radiant countenance how the girls made it up no one ever knew but after much talking and crying kissing and laughing the breach was healed and peace declared a slight haze still lingered in the air after the storm for fanny was very humble and tender that evening tom a trifle pensive but distressingly polite and polly magnanimously friendly to every one for generous natures like to forgive and polly enjoyed the petting after the insult like a very human girl as she was brushing her hair at bedtime there came a tap on her door and opening it she beheld nothing but a tall black bottle with a strip of red flannel tied round it like a cravat and a cocked hat note on the cork inside were these lines written in a sprawling hand with very black ink dear polly a pedal dock is first rate for springs you put a lot on the flannel and do up your wrist and i guess it'll be all right in the morning will you come a sleigh ride tomorrow 
I'm awfully sorry I hurt you. Tom. End of chapter 5